Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, where we sit down with local elected leaders from across Canada. Throughout this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they work to make their community a better place for everyone. In today's final episode of the Cross Border Interviews for 2023, we are honored and so pleased to be sitting down with the municipality of Tantramar, New Brunswick, Mayor Andrew Black. But before we dive into our interview, 2024 is right around the corner. And for the month of December, we are running an exclusive 2024 New Year special. For just $20.24 every three months during 2024, immerse yourself in a year of exclusive perks and behind-the-scenes access to great content we have in store for you. So be ready to be part of the national conversation around municipalities and experience the magic of cross-border interviews. Simply head over to our website and click the support the show link today and subscribe to our quarterly holiday special and make your first donation today. Now on to our very last episode for 2023 with Mayor Black. Andrew, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start as this is, I'm going to say this now, this is my last episode of 2023, and I am pleased to be sitting down with you to chat about municipal politics and yourself. And I want to start with the question I've asked every single guest I've had on this year, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Andrew? Uh, well, I, Sackville, the, the the town that I live in, we're, we're in the municipality of Tantramar now, but the town of Sackville is where I spent most of my life. Um, my wife and I returned back to Sackville about 16 years ago. Um, I opened a couple of small businesses in that time. I, I worked for a couple of local businesses and I got involved in community groups, um, mostly from having kids, but sitting on nonprofit boards and getting involved in the community. Um, and so I, you know, I had a background as, and an understanding of what, what that means to, to do something for your community. Um, a friend of mine was a, a former counselor in the town of Sackville. And when he was done his term, he came to me and he said, look, you should run. I, I think you'd be good at it. It's really rewarding. Um, you know, that if I had known the, the first four years of being on council would be <laughs> would be as a steeple learning curve. I maybe I would have said something different to my friend, um, but uh, I, yeah, I, I put my name in and and ran and and won. So I've been on council since uh, 2016, and this is my third term. My first as mayor. Okay, so you've mentioned a few names there, and I want to sort of clarify this whole uh, confusions before we get into some of the issues and the, the later part of the interview. So you were elected in 2016 as a councillor for the town of Sackville, but you yes. were elected as mayor of, for the municipality of Tantramar. Explain to me and my listeners how that comes about, because it just doesn't seem normal for you to be a councillor in one area, then a mayor in a different area, but it's truly the same. Well, um, and I mean, we can get into this as deep as you want. It could be our, our full 45 minute conversation, but I love it. <laughs> the, the province of New Brunswick in starting in 2022, the provincial government uh, through the minister of local government enacted a municipal reform. So province wide, a, a forced amalgamation. So a, a provincial realigning of municipalities to include former, formerly unrepresented what's called local service districts. So large chunks of land of population that didn't have any um, municipal representation other than the minister of local government himself. So uh, like many other municipalities, new municipalities within the province, former town of Sackville, we also had a village of Dorchester that had a mayor and a council. Um, so the two of us amalgamated with a, a former local service district or a rural area to form a new municipality. During that process, one of the one of the biggest arguments we had, I would say, was what was our new name going to be? So we are after some back and forth, and we had a few names that we were interested in. The municipality of Tantramar is where uh, is is where who we're known as and where we are now. So you're saying it wasn't as easy as the city of Miramichi, where Miramichi and Newcastle merged, and Miramichi sort of won that name battle. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, certainly not. But I mean, you know, if you ask me, like I'm sitting in my office right now in the in the town hall 
which is located in Sackville. So it's still the town of Sackville. Um, this morning I was at a meeting in the village of Dorchester. Uh, so we're in the municipality of Tantramar, but I am still currently physically in the town of Sackville. So Do you I, mind me asking what Tantramar means? Uh, yes, um, Tantramar, uh, uh, well actually out my window and you can't see it, but um, in between here and Nova Scotia, there is a sizable marsh and it is called the Tantramar Marsh. Um, it's a beautiful, flat, biodiverse area that uh, we appreciate and, and uh, you, you cannot not consider it because it's so big and vast and beautiful. Um, that name comes from uh, an Acadian word called, which is Tintamar, which is, means a loud, uh, raucous noise. Uh, and so the anglicized version of that word is um, tantramar. And so that's uh, that's where the name came from. So it has a historical background in our Acadian culture, uh, but also has a, an anglophone uh, touch as well. And our local high school is called the Tan is called Tantramar High School. So it, it worked out well. <laughs> it certainly did. Um, so now that we've got that out of the way, let's let's turn back to you for a few minutes here before we turn to the municipality of Tantramar. And uh, you you talked about your duty to serve. But from your background, and I looked at your resume before this interview because I, I want to learn a little bit about you because you, you kind of scare me a little bit because you were just in front of the Senate and your resume per, is quite extensive. And it doesn't seem like municipal politics would have been a fit for you, but you chose municipal politics. What was the desire besides that one person asking you, besides that former councillor asking you, had you ever considered going into municipal politics or had you considered other levels of politics prior to that discussion? Uh, no, I would <laughs> say no. Um, now, that being said, um, I, I I had followed uh, council a little bit, probably not as much as I, I should have, but I, call, I followed council, I followed town business leading up to when I decided to run. Um, it's my community. I have an interest in what we're doing, where we're going and the vision um, but another piece of it is that I have three kids. Uh, we moved back here to have a family. So at the time when I ran, I had my oldest, well, now my oldest daughter, but a daughter. Now I have a son and we have a, a, another daughter. And part of it too was, you know, I, I believe in this community. I believe in the strength of the people who live here. And I want to try to make it a better place, not just for my kids, but for everyone. And so it seems to me that being involved in municipal government, the closest government to the people, the most relatable, is an opportunity to do that. I believe I believed it then. I believe it even more so now. You talk about the closest to the people. You're right when you say that. But that comes with its challenges, too, because that means that you, when you make a decision, which I'm assuming in eight years on council, you have had to make some pretty tough decisions. You hear about it locally because you don't go off to the Capitol to do your job. You don't go off to Ottawa to do your job. You are there and you are in the grocery store the next day. In your four, in your sorry, eight years uh, on council uh, and just recently as mayor, has municipal politics changed a lot in the province of New Brunswick and in Tantramar besides the amalgamation? Uh, well, yes, it certainly has, especially more recently, I would say within, well, certainly municipal reform has changed what, what local government uh, means. Um, for example, we have, we have more responsibility now under this new this new municipal reality within the province of New Brunswick. Um, we have, we've had some download of responsibilities to it from the provincial level to municipalities. You know, we're dealing with things like healthcare, housing, um, well, homelessness. Uh, you know, it's not as big here as it is in the major cities in New Brunswick, but it's still an issue. And like, uh, you know, mental and mental health and, and addictions. These are things that, you could argue would be provincial or federal concern. Yet here we are as a municipality, a local, locally elected uh, council talking about and potentially dealing with these issues. So that has changed the municipal reality within, um, within New Brunswick. Um, but even, even a few years ago when the housing crisis hit, you know, when I got on council seven, eight years ago, we were never talking about housing. We were not. If a development came to town, we did our responsibility, right? We 
did zoning, we did public hearings and all that kind of stuff. Now there's a, a responsibility on us as a municipality, uh, either you know downloaded from the province, but certainly being called on by our citizens for us to take a step and, and do that, do some of that work ourselves. So three years ago, this really started happening and it, you know, COVID I'm sure had something to do with that, but yeah, it is definitely different now than it was when I got on council eight years ago. You you talk about citizens and I, want, I, I often ask this question to all the municipal leaders who come on and it's about the jurisdictional roles and responsibilities. Now, you, you know them, you know where the municipality begins and where the municipality ends jurisdictionally, the province begins and ends in the federal government. But in my conversations across Canada and particularly in New Brunswick, I'm hearing from municipal leaders that the average resident doesn't care about those jurisdictional roles. They want you as their local official and you laugh, but it's true. They yeah. want you as their local official to address those issues that they're having, whether it be at school board. How important is it to listen to the people who have those issues, whether it be a, a healthcare issue, an education issue, but at the same time, still tell them, if you want to talk to your MLA, that would probably get you a little bit further on addressing these issues that you have with the healthcare system. Or do you just take it as mayor and then call your M the local MLAs because it's probably quicker to get a call back from your MLA as mayor than it is as a potential citizen? Well, in, in my opinion, I think it's a, a bit of both. Um, you're, you're right. And I, and, I, and I certainly don't mean any disrespect, but I think there's a lot of people out there that don't really understand governance, whether it's uh, local governance, provincial or federal, it's complicated. It is a complicated system. Um, and oftentimes I think people, people really only are concerned about municipal, let's just talk about municipal government, when something goes wrong and maybe they're directly impacted by it, right? Um, and again, I don't mean that disrespectfully. It's, it's true. People have busy lives. They have things that they want to take care of. They don't want to have to keep on top of everything all the time. If they have a, an issue that is concerning to them, then they come to their elected officials and talk about it. For me, it's an opportunity to, uh, as an education piece for the public, like, thank you for coming to me about your healthcare concern. Just to give you some idea, it, it isn't really in our jurisdictional purview to be involved in, uh, and maybe you finding another, a doctor, maybe that's what it is. Um, that is it hard said, to say that though? Is it hard to say it's not in our purview because they've come to you for a reason? Sure. They're not they're not doing it out of their just because they're they may be un, not knowing of what the jurisdictional purview. They've come to you because they may have a better relationship with you than their MLA or MP. Right. So I mean, it, it's a teachable moment, and it is yeah. difficult to say that. But part of it is being sympathetic to the fact that this person has a legitimate problem, a legitimate issue that that they need help with. So my next step would be here is who you need to contact. If it's your MLA, if it's a you know a local MP, if it's a Horizon Health Board official, whoever it is, I would direct them. And then my follow up is usually if you don't hear anything, you get back to me, and I will make sure that there's a response. Um, I, I like giving some authority or reinforcing the authority that people who live in my town have um, to other levels of government. As someone who lives here, you, you can, because you have the power to do that. You could reach out to your MLA, you can reach out to your MP. That, you have that right, you have that authority. And reinforcing that I think is, is smart. But if they don't get anywhere, then I don't mind certainly stepping in or, or my other, my fellow counselors. As I said earlier on, you've had to make some pretty tough choices probably in the last uh, few years on council, even with COVID-19. And let's just say the housing crisis as well, affordability crisis that the country is going through right now. And you, though, have to sort of make the best decision for the the entire community. And you know you're not going to please 100% of the people in your community. How do you see yourself in making those tough decisions? Because you have to make them and not everyone's going to benefit from every decision that you make, but sometimes you're going to have to make the tough choices to say, unfortunately, this is not going to affect you, but it's going to help a larger portion of people. Right. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's always <laughs> a difficult one, right? Like I I've often said, and, it, and it's, and it's very different 
from being a counselor and being a mayor. I mean, this is my first time being mayor. So that, that, that the question is a little different. As, as far as a mayor, uh, you know, it's my responsibility to attempt to inform counsel and support them in their decision making. Um, whereas with a counselor, I almost felt in some ways that I had more power because, you know, I was the lawmaker, you know, as, as an individual counselor, but, you know, more specifically as the body of counsel. Um, so <laughs> I, I've often said, it, you know, oftentimes what the, what your citizens want, you know, kind of runs like this. And then the decision of counsel that is made runs like this. Oftentimes it's pretty much parallel. You're right that you're not going to please everyone, and there's issues that are that put people on both sides of the fence. But then every every now and then the the public kind of goes out this way, but comes back in, and then council may go out this way, but come back in. Generally, the decisions that you make are in line with, you know, the majority of the population of your community. Um, but there have been lots of times where you have to make those tough decisions, as you say, and really it's it's. You know, I'm interested in factual information that is accurate. And when I make a decision, um, I'm making it for the benefit of the community. Um, oftentimes, it's the conversations afterwards with people who don't agree with the decision that you make, where sometimes you make your biggest gains and say, look, I, I realize that, that you don't, you didn't agree with that decision. Tell me why you didn't. And let me tell you why I made or why we made the decision that we did. And then hopefully that conversation can kind of alleviate some of that hesitancy with local government. Um, anyway. Oh, I. Sorry, I muted myself because I, uh, I heard a dog bark. So I'm going to cut this part out. Are people willing to give their feedback? Because when I speak to municipal councillors, there's there's often an apathy, like you said earlier on. As long as everything's going right, we don't really care about what's going on in the municipal government. As long as my garbage is picked up and my water's turned on when I want to have a shower, I'm happy. But it sounds like in Tantramar, people are willing to actually give their feedback and maybe it's only because of the bad things that you might vote on that they think is bad <laughs> but do you see that there is an apathy and if not are you happy with the engagement level that your community has with its council well i i do think that um that the the, the people who live here in tantrum are, are fairly engaged i i wouldn't say it's at the level where i want them to be and, and maybe it never will be and i think the same could be said for municipalities across the country um, but we do hear from a lot of our citizens, uh, whether it's through email or a phone call. Sometimes people will drop into town hall and my office door is open um, or unfortunately, social media. <laughs> social media puts a, presents a whole other challenge. You don't um, say you don't say social media is yeah. one of those weird things there. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, we but we do have a fairly engaged community and um you know, I'm just thinking about a like we had a a, a recent housing development, um, an apartment development, and we had a public hearing. We had 50, probably 50 plus people who came here at that public hearing and gave their uh, feedback. You know, this is why we should not have it. This is why we should have it. Some of those people, after the decision was made, wrote back to say, "Hey, good job making that decision." While others wrote or called and said. I have some real problems with you making that decision and I'm disappointed. So again, it's an opportunity for a conversation. And I, I love those moments because I, I, I learn a lot. Hopefully I can give some uh, reflection and some opinion to people who may have a, a problem with the decision that's made. At the end of the day, if we walk away and we're both still on either side of the fence, well, that's fine. But at least there needs to be some understanding of where we each come from. Now, going back to a previous question about balancing sort of how do you make sure everyone feels like they're being heard, but also ensure that they're uh, that you're going to please everyone. You're in a unique position right now because you are the very first mayor of the municipality of Tantramar. And this is, comes with a hefty sort of job, not just as mayor of the council, but making sure the entire community feels as one. And when you make decisions, you are making it as the entire community. And you as mayor have to make sure that you're balancing the needs of the former community of Dorchester, the uh, town of Sackville, and even the unincorporated areas that were amalgamated into Tantramar. Has that been tricky over the last year of balancing that 
entire municipality rather than just individual towns? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I okay. mean, it's, it's been one of our, it, it's one of our biggest challenges. Um, if, if not the biggest, I mean, re reform as a whole has left municipalities in a position where they are responsible for all of the decisions that the province made through the reform process. You know, re the re reform, you know, the, the town of Sackville existed, let's just say in the village of Dorchester, existed until December 31st, 2022. New Year's Day, you know, the turn of the clock, those were gone and the municipality of Tantramar was created. And then the provincial government said, there you go. So it has been, hard it's been really problematic we have we have a we have a budget for our whole new municipality that budget has subunits we have shared services and local services so we have money you know we we have our tax base that kind of all goes into a pool but that money is still being doled out in different ways that are you know supportive of one area over another as a as a as a, a shared or local service and then money that's uh, specific to the former town of Sackville, for example, or the former village of Dorchester. So it's going to be a number of years, I would say, probably another four years at the very least, before we get to the point where we are more united as a community in some ways. I think if you talk to people in Miramichi, you had mentioned Miramichi earlier, or if you talk to HRM, you know, the Halifax Regional Municipality, they've been They've been amalgamated for a number of years, and that is still a thorn in people's sides. We're never going to get there. It'll take a long, long time before that, you know, we're, we're entirely united. But the after effects of reform is, is really what we need to push through to get to a point where we feel united and, and as one without a loss of identity. And that's, well, and, that, and that's what I was going to try and talk about, because you, you as mayor and council, I say you as the royal you, have to look at every issue and people look at the council to lead by example. In the last year, have you found that your council has been doing that in, in ensuring that that unity is there, that cohesion is there, but that identity is still a part of people's day-to-day -day lives where they feel like, I'm I'm a former village of Dorchester resident. I, 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 I know I live in Tantramar now, but I will always be. It's the old Sky Dome analogy, right? In Toronto, it's yep. the Sky Dome. Now it's called the Rogers Centre, but everyone still calls it the uh, Sky Dome because that's what we grew up. Exactly. I mean <laughs> exactly. So do you see yourself as mayor and council trying to ensure that while the identity is there, you have to identify as one and not individually? Yeah, I mean, it, it's helped that when we, uh, when we went through the reform process, one of the questions that was asked was, what do you want your governance structure to look like? Do you want to be like we have, we went from uh, the numbers not quite 70 kilometers uh, squared to a municipality of just over 700 kilometer square. So do you want to have a count? How many council members do you want? Right. And do you want them all at large or do you want to do a ward system? So at the time, the a subcommittee that was created for the reform process decided that it would be better to have a ward system. So, and that has helped. We have councillors that are, um, that are specifically um, representative, rep rep representative of their, uh, their ward. So Village of Dorchester, for example, has a ward councillor. The former, the three former LSD areas all have a ward councillor, and then there's four councillors for the former town of Sackville. So there's balance in that. Um, you have someone you could immediately go to that represents your area. Now, we are still all members of the Council of Tantramar, so we are we need to be united, and we have been, I would say, generally, um, in our decision making that we're doing what's best for the full community, but still representing those areas um, as ward councillors and council. Um, I would say that being amalgamated has brought some great opportunities. Um, we've been uh, we've been doing a lot of, of a lot of programming for example with our recreation our active living and culture department in the former village of Dorchester uh, we've been you know Dorchester 
Village of Dorchester did what they could with the budget they could, but they were a small community. Now we have, we have a little more power, we have a little more authority. And so we're able to do some of the things um, that was difficult for the Village of Dorchester before to do. And I think that it's been, it's been great for that area. The issue now is the local service districts. So the, again, the, the province has pushed this on us. The local service districts are now represented by the council of, of, of Tantramar. But really, um, you know, road plowing of roads, maintenance of roads, these kinds of things are all still under control of the province. So it, it I know. So it, it gives a okay. It it it, it just gives a, a confusion of jurisdictional responsibility, yet still puts the onus of of problems that might arise in our community on our council and staff, and it's. Uh, it's prob it's problematic and it's hard. It's hard to deal with, but I think we've been pretty good at coming together. It's gonna, like I said, it's still gonna take a few years for us to get there, but we're trying our best to unite um, as a new municipality. Now I want to turn to my second segment because I am cautious of time. And before I ask this question, I want to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council, a direction of council, or policy of council. I do not know why, but after a year of doing these, I still get emails about this question. But here we are in 2023. Uh, mayor Black, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the municipality of Tantramar today? Um. I think I think housing um, and healthcare would be that would be the two big ones. I would I would throw on top of that the 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 new municipal reality. I, I would I would put that as an umbrella over over those. Um, and I, we've already talked about it, but you know, sort of post reform, how we're moving ahead. Um, but if you asked a lot of people within our community, what are the what are some of your top concerns? Um, healthcare, housing, um, policing, those are three that come up pretty much consistently, especially the first two over the last three or four years. But I think healthcare and, and housing are the two big challenges that we face in our community currently. Okay, so you know, and I know that uh, healthcare is a provincial issue, but it is uh, creeping into the municipal realm a little bit. Housing is a municipal issue, a provincial issue, a federal issue, a residential, a development issue. It is all of the above issue. I want to talk about those two issues particularly for a few minutes, if that's okay. I want to start with housing because it is not unique to Tantramar. It is something I'm hearing from municipal leaders from across Canada. What are you doing in the short term? What can the municipality do in the short term to incentivize developers? Because while we have a housing crisis, it is on the backdrop of an affordability crisis, which means developers are not building as quickly as they can because A, they don't have staff, and B, the cost of uh, goods and services is through the roof. So what does the municipality have to do in the short term to alleviate some of these housing issues? First of all, let me just say that you framed that beautifully. <laughs> And it's something that a lot of people don't understand. Um, you know, it, it, there's healthcare and housing both are incredibly complex and complicated issues. Um, I, I would argue that all three orders of, of government have some role and responsibility to play, and, and you know, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, for the municipal sector. Anyway, um, so I. I I would say that what our municipality is doing or what municipalities in general need to do is to try to foster development growth, but that's difficult. Um, here in Tantramar, we have, well, actually it's still in the former town of Sackville because we have bylaws that are for Sackville and for Dorchester that we still haven't got to yet to kind of put them into Tantramar. That's another work in progress. Um, but we have an economic development incentive program where if you're building a multi-unit uh, residential building or maybe it maybe it's a whole bunch of townhouses or whatever there is a tax incentive for you to do so within our community um, it could be over five years could be over 10 years there's stipulations of course but you would get a tax break on your property taxes so that you would build um, now uh, there is not an affordability piece built into that but it's something that we can look at and we probably will look at as a municipality going forward. Um, that being said, 
our municipality, like most of municipalities, needs to increase housing stock, period, in general. You know, we need affordable housing, we need appropriate housing, we need wraparound service housing, we need semi-detached homes, we need family homes, we need apartments, we need everything because it will raise that housing stock. Um, it would be wonderful if everything could be affordable. Uh, the most recent housing development that's going up will have some affordable units in it through the CMHC um, uh, funding structure, which is great. We need to have more of that. In New Brunswick, and I don't know if you've heard this stat, but for, for every one unit of affordable housing that's created, we lose seven. So it's, uh, yeah. It's, what? It's Wait, real what? <laughs> I've yeah, never so heard that. Say that again, yeah. because I just want to make sure I understand. So every one unit of ho affordable housing that you build, you yes. lose seven just, I, I don't want to say regular housing, but just affordable. Uh, like, Affordable, affordable, affordable units. So we're not, we're not only, we're not building enough affordable units within this province, even though, even if we are building some, we're losing more than we're building. So we're going to get to that crisis point where we're not going to have affordable housing period. Now, this is why there's such a push, you know, from the federal government, certainly um, even to direct, direct transfers to municipalities to try to get people to build more affordable housing. Uh, anyway, so we need housing in general. And for us as a municipality, we have this economic development incentive program. The other part of it is, uh, or the other piece that we're doing locally is I've created a mayor's round table on housing. So we have a, a group of people that meet. Some of them are working on housing. Some of them are interested in housing. Some of them have advocated on housing, whatever the case may be. We meet as a group and we discuss housing and how we're going to deal with it at, at a municipal level here within our community. Um, some of the members of that group include the MLA, our, our local MLA, for example. So we have a, a provincial, a local, a nonprofit and a development sort of group that is meeting and talking about how we can develop housing, uh, how the municipality can work towards better housing. So that conversation is ongoing. This is still new for us as a municipality. So there's there's a lot that we we need to do moving forward. But housing comes with infrastructure issues as well, because we always forget about that aspect of the housing crisis, that yeah. the infrastructure needs to be hooked up, needs to be put in place. And the recent FCM uh, conference, I, I understand there was a press conference and it was $107,000 on average okay. for just one house to be built for infrastructure upgrades. Um, I'm not not dismissing the uh, municipality of Tantraburg, but you are not the same size as, say, Fredericton or St. John or even Halifax or even Toronto. Um, is that sustainable in your community? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm asking the very well, weird I mean, questions. I apologize. It's a, Ed. <laughs> it's a little different. Like you know, there's there's some there's some beauty to being a small community because um, you know I it's difficult in cities when. You, when you're talking about uh, densification, because really all you can do is build up. There's only so much land you have available because um, you want densification to happen in your downtown area where people don't have to travel as much and it makes it a little easier. And um, But that being said, a small municipality like Tantramar, we have our own infrastructure worries as well. Um, currently our stormwater, wastewater and, uh, and water sources can sustain development within our community. Will that always be the case? We'll have to deal with that as when the next development comes up. It's something that we're gonna be looking at going forward before we have our next housing development, whenever that will be. Um, but I was at that FC, I sit on the board for FCM and I was at the advocacy days in, in, in uh, Ottawa when we spoke about that. Now it's $107,000 now per house, but only three months ago, it was 93,000. So that price of, of uh, you know, sort of the bare minimum of supporting one housing unit, whatever that is, to be built for infrastructure of 107,000 could be much, much more in three to six months. So is it sustainable? No. And I think the, the, the proof is in the pudding that municipalities need some kind of uh, you know, financial lever, some core support when it comes to infrastructure to even tackle something like housing. I'm going to ask a very political question right now, and I apologize to put you on the spot, but is the Higgs government coming to the table? On housing? On helping? On, in, on infrastructure? On both. 
Wow, that is a tough question. Um, I, I, I think, I think that they could be doing more. I, I will say that there's been some good things that have happened, particularly in housing. We now have the New Brunswick Housing Hub, which was created to support uh, you know, mainly rural communities and their housing efforts. Um, that came about because of the provincial government. That never would have happened if it wasn't for some funding sources available through, uh, through the provincial government to be able to make that happen. Again, the Housing Hub is new. They only really hit the ground running in May. So we'll see how that group, uh, you know, comes to the table representing both the province and municipal interests when it comes to housing. But, you know, I'll, I'll give credit where credit is due. Um, it would be nice if there was, you know, some better funding opportunities through the province, directly from the province to support housing initiatives within local municipalities. Because a lot of that funding, you know, not, not being, uh, you know, not, not trying to, to play, the place, play the blame game, but comes from the federal government. Yeah. You know, rapid housing initiative, uh, housing accelerator fund, um, you know, incentive for developers. A lot of that comes through, through the federal government and not the provincial government. Okay. So that's so, my political, that's my political answer to your political question. Well, I appreciate the political answer to the political question. I want to talk about healthcare now because healthcare comes in many different facets. You talked about mental health and addictions. You talked about uh, there's just the traditional like hospital access. What do you mean by uh, uh, healthcare is an issue in your community? Is it the mental health and addictions or is there a shortage of doctors that people can't see and they have to go to other communities to get access to a, a family physician? So it, I guess it's both. Um, I, I can't really speak too much about the mental health and addiction side because it really, again, it's really, it's new. Not, it's not new, it's been there. But our responsibility in that realm um, is, is really new for, for our municipality and other municipalities within, uh, within the province. Not so much the larger city centers, they've been dealing with this forever. Um, but the, yeah, the doctor recruitment the nurse shortage. So I'll, I'll give a really quick, like Cole's notes on our, our specific healthcare issue. In 2020, just before the pandemic hit, our local hospital um, was going to be closed. Uh, Premier Higgs at the, uh, and the uh, CEO of Horizon Health, there's two health boards in the province. The CEO at the time of Horizon Health were at the hospital getting ready to close the doors. So the local community found out about this because it was really, you know, secretive and a couple hundred people rallied within 15 minutes to be outside the hospital, basically demanding for Higgs and the CEO to stop that conversation and to look at saving our hospital. And then the pandemic hit. And then there was a realization that, wow, our local hospital is key. And it was a huge uh, piece of the puzzle when it came to trying to alleviate uh, COVID issues within our community and beyond. Um, from that, we had a local group called the Memram Cook Tantramar Community Task Force. Memram Cook is a, is a French community that's just uh, on the other side of us. Um, that task force was, was created to help deal with COVID issues locally that maybe the province, the Horizon Health the health department and the local governments couldn't help deal with. They create, they kind of self-governed, came together. And from that group, uh, another splinter group was created called the Rural Health Action Group. That group locally um, has basically helped Horizon, worked with Horizon to get our hospital back up to a full complement of nurses. It was about a year and a half, but they worked on recruitment. They worked on retention. They worked on uh, workplace and life balance. They worked on uh, sustainability plans, all kinds of, of support for the hospital. Um, so you're asking from the local level, this is where our, the municipality is, is involved. Um, this is a community run group, but, but there has been somebody from council and staff that have been involved with that group from day one. Um, working to help Horizon and give them the tools they need to be able to support the hospital that we almost lost. Wow. Uh, now the next phase is doctors. We have lost two doctors and 
um, maybe even a third, maybe two doctors and like a half a doctor within the last year. You know, that's, that's a, you know, probably close to 1200 people might even be more than that who don't have a family doctor now. So it, it's a, there's a, a healthcare crisis in our community when it comes to healthcare service delivery. Um, the Rural Health Action Group, the municipality and Horizon Health have been trying to work to, together to, uh, to attempt to fix that. Um, I feel like we could talk about healthcare for just an hour in itself, but we're doing Absolutely. very high level here. Um, and I'm cautious of time. You've talked about th uh, two in our conversation so far, two very macro issues in your community, healthcare, housing. But like you said, if I go talk to your community, if I was happen to be there next year, which I'm planning on being in Tantramar in 2024, and I visit and I talk to 10, 20, 100 people, and I ask them that exact same question. Yes, they'll give me the macro issues, like you said, but they're going to give me some micro issues as well. That pothole, mm -hmm. that playground, you know, and I, th I believe the majority of people listening at now finally know that municipalities cannot run deficits. You have a certain amount of money and you cannot run a deficit. How do you balance the needs of the community against the individual need? Because you want people to feel like their issues are being resolved micro at the local level, but you as mayor and council have to look at every issue and see the bigger picture. How is this going to benefit Tantramar as a whole? How do you balance that aspect of the job? Because that is probably the toughest part of any municipal leader is making sure that everyone's voices are being heard and their concerns are being addressed. Well, yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I mean, a lot of that is conversation on the street. You know, if I, my wife will say, hey, can you go and get some milk or a couple of groceries at the grocery store? I'm like, are you, are you sure? Because it's going to be 45 minutes, right? Um, you know, a lot of that, there's a lot of conversation with, with individual people from town, I'm sure my fellow counselors would agree. Um, but I would say in a, in a broader sense, it's the budgeting process. We have a very robust budgeting process uh, that we go through. We have, uh, the public has an opportunity to come and address council to say, here are some things that I think that we need to be spending money on. Um, it could be a nonprofit group, it could be it may be a sports team. It could just be someone, just a resident from town who comes to council and says, here are some things that are important. Um, if we get emails, if we get messages received during the budgeting process, all of that is considered. Now, at the end of the day, are all of those people's issues covered in the budgeting process? Absolutely not. But through the subsequent conversations, and I mean, our budgeting process, we probably have five or six, maybe even more council meetings within a two month period where we're going you know, back and forth on capital and reserve funds and all kinds of you know, conversation and discussion. There's, you need to have an understanding about uh, the needs of the community, what people have asked for, what had to be cut or left out of the budget, why, and then why uh, an explanation as to what is in the budget and why it's more important or important um, than some of the issues that were brought up by the, by the public. Now, I would say if it was like a pothole, there's a good chance that a pothole problem is gonna be solved in, in the budgeting process. If you're doing due, dil due diligence and you're following your asset management plan, then you're probably going to be addressing some of the major infrastructure issues that are, that are in your town, if you can afford it. Um, but if it's, uh, you know, I think we need a new park. Uh, well, that park could be $1.5 million, let's say, if, if you were gonna build a new park. Does that fit within our strategic plan? Does it fit within our vision for our community? What would have to be taken out of the budget to account for that? Would taxes have to go up to account for it? So all of that just needs to be explained through the budgeting process. And you hope that the majority of the people who live in your community are following the budget process and are and uh, and understand it and can and uh, can ask questions if they need to. I appreciate that honest answer. Um, I want to turn to my last subject here because I'm cautious of time and it is sure. my favorite subject, and that is tourism. I think tourism okay. is a municipal issue that not a lot of municipalities deal with. <clears throat> Truly, on a uh, on a uh, 
countrywide scale. I'm a big proponent of visiting Canada and its hidden treasures. And as I said earlier on, I will be visiting Tantramar in 2024 because I have a big swing through Atlantic Canada. So hopefully we can grab a coffee while I'm out there. But sure. what are some of the hidden treasures in Tantramar that a tourist as municipal leaders who are listening to this should see if they come and visit your community? Well, uh, so again, you know, through the reform process, the reform process was rough. It's it's left us with a lot of challenges, but the opportunities around reform have been have been incredible. Now, if you're talking about, you know, like I said, we're de- like town of Sackville, 70 kilometers squared to municipality of Tantrum are 705. We have uh, natural uh, beauty here and natural spots that I think are really key to see. Um, and now a lot of those fall within our municipal boundary, which is wonderful. We have a very robust tourism development um, structure here within our municipality. We have a manager of business and tourism development. Um, we highlight as much as we possibly can. We have community involvement that uh, responds to our newsletter so that we can highlight places that are doing things or maybe a grand opening of a business. We try really, really hard to highlight our community within our community and, and beyond. Um, but we, uh, we are just last year, um, Sackville, the former town of Sackville, got recognized as the only um, UN recognized wetland city within, all, within the entire Western hemisphere. There's only about uh, 28 communities in the world that are recognized with this, re- with this recognition from the UN. And we're the only one in the in the entire this entire half of the world. Um, we have a, a, and most of that hinges on our waterfowl park, which is which is a, a a gem right within the downtown. Beautiful spot to go and take a walk. Um, and we have uh, within our new municipal boundary, we have the Fundy Biosphere, which is a, again a UN recognized um, natural location. Uh, in Shepherdy Bay, uh, in just just in Dorchester, Johnson's Mills is there, which is a stopover spot for the sandpiper, the semi-palmated sandpiper. Um, you can see them in thousands and thousands and thousands when they stop for their journey south. Um, we have Fort Beauséjour, which is a natural historic site um, that is now within our municipal boundary, um, and then of course the Tantramar Marsh. So lots of natural stuff. But we have so many other opportunities. Uh, over in Dorchester, we have Ladysmith Manor, which is uh, one of the oldest houses in the area. Um, it's been completely redesigned inside um, and is absolutely beautiful and a sight to see. The old Dorchester Jail has been turned into a bed and breakfast, and it is a, a, a fantastically unique experience. Um, th- there's also a museum that's that's uh, that's part of that that is that is amazing to see. You can spend a night there. Uh, overnight as in a B, in a B and B in a jail and you get this full experience. It's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, well, then, you've sold me on it so far. <laughs> so then, I'm gonna, um, Go ahead. One last, I'll mention one last thing we have um, over in Point of Butte, which is on your way to uh, Nova Scotia. There's Truman Farms, which started out as a little you pick um, and then has since grown. And I swear every year they add something to it. They make their own ice cream. It's, a, in my opinion, it's the best ice cream in New Brunswick, if not all of Atlantic Canada. Um, and they have, uh, they, they, it's just, it's an experience. You got to go Truman Farm, uh, and and it's an, an amazing, amazing spot within our new community. And I mean, that's just scratching the surface. There's, there's so much to to see. It's, it's unreal. Well, when I'm out there in 2024, I'll make sure that I get to all of it, but plus more. <laughs> but I'm going to I'm going to basically ask you to pick a favorite child here in some sense, but where do you go in the community? What's your favorite spot in Tantramar that you can go and you can just escape because the realities of the day-to-day world of a mayor in a small town is pretty daunting and you have to sometimes just decompress. Where's that safe space for you? Where's that place that you can go and just let it all go away? Well, I, I would joke and say my basement because <laughs> I can't uh, I can't really go anywhere within the municipality to fully escape. But um, we uh, my house is is very close to the waterfowl park, 
um, which also is connected to the uh, the NB Trail, so the the Great Trail, the um, we call it the Rails to Trails because it used to be the old rail line, and and it, I I walk or bike or run uh, sometimes I'll snowshoe on that trail. It's uh, it's right on the marsh, and it the the again this sort of flat serene beauty of the Tanchamar Marsh and just being surrounded by that is a, a very calming thing for me. Um, being involved in nature as much as possible is where I'm at. It's where I'm happiest. Uh, so that would be, I think that would be my choice of, of where I would go to uh, potentially escape. <laughs> um, so for the last time uh, in 2023, I'm going to ask my last million dollar question. And that is, in your opinion, what mm -hmm. makes the municipality of Tantramar such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Oh man, that's such a big question. Um, well, that's why uh, I leave it to the end. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I think the the municipality of Tantramar has much to offer. We have uh, we have incredible cultural uh, diversity here. We have uh, amazing um, programs and yearly events. We have a fantastic farmers market. We have the Mount Allison University located right in the middle of our municipality that presents a whole other uh, slew of opportunities for people visiting and people living here. Um, we are, our backbone of this community is agriculture. We have a very robust agricultural background with many, many farms that, that support both local and uh, regional um, uh, economy. Uh, and, and, you know, like I said, the Tantramar Marsh, the Bay of Fundy, the dike system that supports us and protects us, at least for now. Um, you know, we 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 have. It's just an amazing experience to be here, um, and the people, the people of our community are warm. They're welcoming. Um, they, there are lots of different backgrounds within our community, and and engagement. Um, I think that people here within Tantramar like having people come here and visit and see the the natural and economic diversity that's here within our community. Andrew, I want to thank you so much. This has been a pleasure to sit down with you for the last, well, now 45 minutes and chat about uh, Tantramar, yourself, your community. It seems like you have a passion for your community and it's always great to talk with leaders from across Canada who do have that passion. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be on the show and for serving your community. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your unwavering interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both aspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, for 2023, it is my hope that you have gained valuable insight into the intricate world of municipal politics this entire year. Now, if you found all of our conversations as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, this year has been a whirlwind for us, and we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light onto the issues affecting municipalities and promoting the local leaders who are doing the great work across this country requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want us to help continue to grow in 2024, please consider visiting our support page, conveniently linked in the show notes below. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content next year you have come to expect from us. Now, we're thrilled. We are absolutely honored. Local leaders from across this great country are still wanting to come on our show and share their stories with us. Each one of them over the last 12 months have brought their own unique perspectives and experiences to our show. We want to thank them. Thank each and every single one of them. So mark your calendars because we are back on February 5th with brand new episodes of the Cross Border Interviews. We have amazing guests already lined up and you will not want to miss them. 
So once again, for the final time in 2023, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking. Happy New Year's, everyone. See you in 2024.